five here. Good evening, folks. This is Melissa Schwartz. I'm with uh, PV United Parent Council. I'm the chair of the gifted committee and we have several people join us this evening. This event is being recorded. So we do ask that um, you put questions you might have through the, uh, the chat and we will then be able to ask them at the end if we have some time. There is a board meeting this evening, so we will be ending promptly at seven o'clock. Sorry about that. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce Elizabeth Warner and let her talk about our special guest this evening. Well, good evening. I'm Elizabeth Warner. I'm the gifted program mentor for the district. And I'm absolutely delighted that tonight we get to spend some time with Dr. Susan Baum. She is the director of the 2E Center for Research and Professional Development at the Bridges Academy, which is a school for twice exceptional students. She recently retired um, as the coordinator of International Graduate Program for Educators at Buffalo State College. She's a professor emeritus of the College of New Rochelle. Um, Susan is known for her seminal work in the education of twice exceptional children and has published extensively on the topic. She's an international consultant. Susan has published in the area of twice exceptional student, students, primary aged gifted students, and social and emotional factors affecting gifted students. She's also um, served on the board of directors of the National Association of Gifted Students and is the past president and co-founder of the Association of Education of Gifted Underachieving a student, uh, Students. And we are absolutely delighted and it's such a joy to have her here tonight to speak to our parents and we have many teachers that are on with us tonight. Um, so welcome, welcome, welcome and thank you again for joining us. Okay, I'm so happy to be here with all of you. To begin, I have a there's an echo. Are we okay? Yes. All right. Okay, so uh, tonight we're going to talk about um, a special population student. Are you hearing some feedback? I'm sorry. I, I'm not hearing echo. I had my mic on mute. Um, did you have uh, do you have another browser open or just this one? No, just this one. Uh, okay, does, I don't hear it now. We're good. So I'm going to share a screen with you and uh, we're going to talk about this group of bright kids with differently wired brains. And I'm going to uh, leave time at the end for questions because I think that it's always good to have some clarity after we have a presentation. So to start off, notice the name of this presentation when the IEP is not enough. Strength-based talent-focused planning for gifted students with differently wired brains. Uh, this is a population of students that is probably the most unrepresented in gifted education. So many of these kids do not get identified and not served properly because their gift might hide their challenges or their challenges might hide their gifts. And uh, when they do get notice, the uh, individual educational plan out of special ed really doesn't isn't designed to meet their needs so with that little introduction let's see let's take a look you can get a copy of this from this website did you get it and we'll put it in the chat. I'm going to start off this presentation with a little overview of the kinds of children we're talking about. And these are kids that I know from my work at Bridges Academy, a school for these bright but wonderful and quirky kids. So let's take a look. 
Just make sure you see this because sometimes... Twice exceptional is different for each person, but I'd say to try and define the general, you know, twice exceptional kid would be someone extremely creative with with a lot of drive to do whatever they set their mind to. I always thought twice exceptional, in my mind at least, meant one of those genius computer hackers like Bill Gates who was able to start companies or hack into the Pentagon or just do something really cool, but was just sort of, when stuck into a social situation, didn't know what to do. To me, it's always, to me, twice exceptional has always meant somebody really smart who's just not very good at parties. There is definitely a typical Bridges child. Kids that are very subdued, but are obviously extraordinarily intelligent. One that doesn't like to do PE would be another one. A Bridges student is kind of an oxymoron. There are no typical Bridges students. Every kid at this school is so out there and different. Everyone calls us 2E, and no one understands how many categories there are within that. I was definitely confused. That's, I mean, part of the whole growing up deal. I was, uh, I was angry in general. Um, I had I have Tourette's, I have ADHD, OCD, all that loveliness. And uh, at the time, it was pretty bad, and I was still getting used to having it and dealing with other people, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I don't know. It was a tricky time. I was holding every other kid back with my loudness. I was very loud. I didn't know how to whisper, so I couldn't even... It wasn't like, oh, the teacher hmm. was teaching some boring thing. Let's have a discussion. I was at a constant yell, and I had trouble sitting quietly in a desk. I don't know if the film, you'll probably cut out scenes where it's happening, but under my chair, my leg is constantly shaking, which is where I've channeled most of the energy. I don't know why we're having trouble with this. It's always is working. Well, let's wait a second. If not, we're just going to go forward. And I will explain better who they are. <laughs> okay. It looks like the play button got un... Yeah. You see that circle? That's not a good sign. <laughs> Let me see if I... It looks like this... My computer is going to be frozen. This isn't good. Let me see if I can stop sharing. All right, let's see what happens if I share again. Uh, talk about some of these kids. I don't know. I don't want to go back to that video. I don't want that problem. So we talk about these kids who have extraordinary gifts. In this case, you saw him briefly, and he has a severe math disability, very little written production, profound anxiety. He was a child who had an undiagnosed learning disability, and by fourth grade, he was so anxious, he started to pull his hair out, and he started cutting himself. Because he was so bright, he was able to hide a lot of these disabilities from his family and the school for quite a while, but at great cost to him. He is extraordinarily bright and outstandingly talented in music. You saw Jack a little bit, and he's um, has diagnosed with ADHD, very hyperactive. He has a lot of attention issues, but he is really funny, clever, the class clown with impeccable timing. He is a delight unless you want him to sit still. He also had severe anxiety. 
And then there's Mac, who is a child who is socially awkward. He was an avid reader, but only wanted to read nonfiction. He's very cognitively rigid, saw the world in black and white. And his best interest was studying wars. And at different years, he would be studying different wars. And when I met him, he was very upset because he didn't understand why the United States did not finish the war in Vietnam. Because if you're entering a war, you're there to win it. And he said that it's very difficult for him to deal with the fact that so there's just as much good in the world as there is evil in the world. And uh, he just, his brain just doesn't work that way. So he was often depressed and had a, an existential depression as well. These are kids then who we know they have specific abilities in specific areas. And they have talents, passions, and a lot of advanced abilities in particular domains, coupled with a variety of what we call disabilities. And putting them together, they equal twice exceptional. The twice meaning they're bright and talented, and they have a series of buts but they may have ADHD, but they may also have oppositional defiant behavior, but they might also be on the spectrum. It's all those challenges that keep them from developing some of those gifts and talents. Sydney was also in that group. You didn't get to see her. And uh, she's a confusing one because she's extremely bright. She has a wonderful vocabulary, uh, tested with attention deficits, also was identified as being on, uh, having, uh, being on the uh, autism spectrum, and um, was extremely oppositionally defiant. When I first met her, she was in the sixth grade, and she, there was another boy in the class who had uh, opposite uh, <clears throat> OCD uh, and he was always cleaning his desk, always straightening up his belongings and she would go over to his desk and she would throw mud on it or the teacher would ask her to read and she turned the book upside down and read it backwards. But what we began to realize about Sydney, a lot of this was beha behavior was a way for her to survive an environment that was quite hostile for her. And a lot of our children who are 2E, some of the behaviors that they manifest are really the results of being in an inappropriate environment. And when we begin to change the environment, some of these behaviors greatly, greatly diminish. I want you to understand these children as being then, in, in, they are the embodiment of two paradoxical sets of behaviors. On the one hand, they have those gifts and talents that we call shiny and gifted. On the other hand, they have these challenges that can become obstacles that get in the way of their development. Now. What often happens is that when they apply for services, schools look at first, look at them as two different people. For Sydney, when she was in, uh, when she was in a school before she came to Bridges Academy, she was identified as gifted. They knew she was artistic and she was identified because of her very high IQ, especially in verbal abilities. She was an advanced reader and she could read three years above grade level. But she was extremely argumentative, oppositional defiant. She produced nothing. 
She had severe attention issues. She refused to participate in physical education and had very poor social awareness and social skills. So her list of challenges was much longer than her list of gifts and talents. And so the school thought the best thing to do for Sydney was to first try to accommodate her gift. So they placed her in a class for advanced readers. They also recommended a social skills program that they had in the school for any child, especially those kids who were on the autism spectrum, who really, and, and uh, from all different ability levels. And they thought her production may be due to the idea that she had poor handwriting and they recommended OT. So I want you to think for a moment, what is good about this plan and what might be problematic? Just think for a moment. The problem with this plan is that it kept Sydney as two different people. When she went to that gifted class for reading, guess what else they required in that class? You know, it was more writing, and she didn't put her ideas in writing. The, teach, the teacher said, how can she be in my advanced ability class when she doesn't produce, and she's also rather sarcastic and arrogant? They put her in the social skills class, and that sarcasm and arrogance went right along with her. She was, her vocabulary so much exceeded that of the other kids in the class that she couldn't really relate to them well. And the reason that she had poor hand, uh, didn't write, had nothing to do with handwriting. It had to do with uh, <clears throat> a poor working memory function and executive function. So what we've come to realize that these kids are very complex and typical solutions don't work. One of the reasons is that when she went to the gifted program, she brought her learning challenges along with her. She didn't leave them out at the front door. And when she went to that social skills program, she was brighter than the rest of the kids. She could speak much more eloquently and her interests did not match any of their interests. And so that in my book, To Be Gifted and Learning Disabled, we talk a lot about the inappropriateness of the IEP because it doesn't include giftedness and it certainly doesn't include information about the gift and talent in the plan. This little image that I'm showing you here just talks about the strengths and needs of a youngster named Caitlin. They talk about the fact that she's bright, she loves creative writing, she really does well in literature circles, she loves working with others when they're kids that she relates to. But the IEP only talks about what she doesn't do. She doesn't have conventions in writing. She's shy, she doesn't know how to follow a series of directions. She doesn't hold her pencil correctly. It never once thinks about how might creative writing help this child learn the conventions? How does her natural creativity you know, and her divergent thinking brain allow her to develop those weak areas? It keeps Sydney as two different children. This IEP deals only with Sydney's blue side. But in fact, Sydney is really green because she's yellow and blue at the same time. Depending on the environmental demands and what kind of environment she's in, she's more yellow. And in other environments, 
she's more blue green and this is important to remember because there is a big variation a big discrepancy between what she can do represented by yellow and those things she absolutely cannot do represented by blue and for these kids it's not easy being green they have a difficult time juggling these huge discrepancies we understand that these that our two-week kids need an environment that considers both their gifts and their challenges simultaneously and understands why these kids do better in an environment that honors their strengths and talents while it minimizes those challenges. Because green means they may have very high level of comprehension, so they have a need for sophisticated content, but they may not read well. They have wonderfully advanced ideas and creative ideas, but they don't have the ability to put them down on paper. They show task commitment. They stay in the struggle. They're in flow in areas of passion, but they have a difficulty attending to a task, especially often when listening to a lecture. They have potential for expertise and higher level thinking, but they often get bogged down at the novice skill le level and the lack of automaticity in reading and writing. They really want to fit in, but they have poor social awareness. And because of these paradoxical behaviors, they become anxious, they use their creativity to survive a hostile environment. For instance, we deem as creative, can you give me 25 uses for a red brick? They might be able to do it, but where we see it manifested is when they give you 25 reasons why they didn't do their homework. They don't, they think that they can't do a lot of things that other kids can do. They feel like failures. They don't like to be different, so they often reject any accommodations, calling it intellectual cheating. And many of them become extremely depressed. We know that when we're looking at this population of children, we need to borrow the philosophy from positive psychology, which says treatment is not just fixing what is broken, it is also nurturing what is best. They're two different things. So what is a strength-based, talent-focused approach? What do we do? It's educational experiences that are designed to align with students' strengths, interests, and talents. And how do we use those? Well, sometimes we leverage these strengths for skill development. For instance, if these kids are artists and they see things visually, it might be that a pre-writing activity for them to organize their ideas would be creating a storyboard like a filmmaker. We also use students' strengths, interests, and talents to enable them to succeed in the regular curriculum, in the core curriculum. We give them ways to engage in any topic in, that's connected to something that's interesting to them. We give them opportunities and, and introduce different learning or instructional strategies, say they like to argue. Some of these kids, we do a personality profile, and some of these kids are great arguers, and they say that they learn best by arguing. Rather than get rid of that argumentative behavior, we want to, might want to make sure there's a little mini debate in that unit, or do a moral dilemma activities that lets them argue. And we also need to make sure that we give them different ways to communicate what they know that align to how, what the, where their talents are and not insist on writing all the time. 
And finally, we have this talent focused environment where we're always on the lookout for new strengths, interests, passions. And we make sure that they end up with a talent plan. We need to nurture those strengths, interests, and talents in their own right. So we begin to call this in some ways dual differentiation because we know that accommodations don't work well for these kids. Instead, what we try to do is make sure that when we engage them in learning that we pay attention to their yellow needs. As a gifted child, they need to be intellectually engaged. That means we can't give them things that they already know. They need to feel the learning is relevant. So if Caitlin was going to get her writing, her creative writing published, all of a sudden it becomes relevant to work on conventions and purposeful learning. But at the same time, we need to make sure that their learning challenges don't prevent them from accessing information, from processing it in their own way, and from communicating what they know. So we, we, ha we call this a duly differentiated approach. So let's see what this looked like in terms of Sydney. Sydney was a fascinating uh, student to work with across the years. When I first came to Bridges, she was in eighth grade and uh, Sydney would not write if she didn't uh, wasn't engaged in the topic and I really never saw her write as an eighth grader. Sydney tried to explain what it's like having this impasse uh, for written expression. It's, you know, I, I think, she said, I think in paragraphs, I speak in sentences, and I write in words. Um, it just keeps diminishing until it's just a struggle to get your thoughts out. <laughs> We knew, though, that Sydney was absolutely an artist through and through. Every cell of her being was meant to create art and do art. So that creating assignments around that strength became a goal and, and it became a joy. So for a couple of years, for all my basic projects in chemistry, I was allowed to draw comics with a bunch of information on specific elements. Like one year I did copper, one year I did gold, one year I did iron, and I did these little comics about them. And I could turn these in and get full credit for them. I've seen her write now and produce pages and pages of fiction and nonfiction, but it was because we knew the entry point and the entry point was the strength. And so how do we know these strengths and how do we understand what to do with these kids? We work with a process called the suite of tools. It's a very intentional way of getting at mostly what's right about these children and making sure we understand what the obstacles of learning. This is a way we want to supplement the IEP to create information that you can't find anywhere on that IEP. And the first tool is called clues. And then we begin to just get the teacher, the parents, different, the student, different teachers, and we simply say, what are the goals you have for Sydney this year? Because not everybody has the same goals. We might be that mom says, I just want Sydney to be happy and have friends and be able to go to teenage parties. And dad says, I want her to stop complaining about school. I need, she needs to get to college. I need to make sure she does her homework. And a teacher might say, I just wish I could get her to pay attention in class. And Sydney might say, I just wish I could do more art all the time. Now, if everyone has a different goal, then, and if we don't understand what these goals are, it's really hard to come up with a plan so we can begin to work on everybody's goals or at least prioritize the goals. And so we do something called taking stock, where we 
try to figure out what are the interests and the learning preferences of these kids. Here's a little clip. Okay, on the front, make sure you've got your name at the top, today's date, and when you guys are ready, go ahead and turn to page two. It's okay. So, page two, the topic is strengths in school. So, if you look at the chart, you'll see it's got a list of subject areas. Some of these are the names of classes. Some of these are topics within those classes. Some of these you may never have had, and you can see that there's a column all the way on the right where you can mark a class you haven't had. But you can check, I like it. You can check, I'm good at it. Or you can check both. Or, of course, you can check neither if you don't like it and you don't feel you're good at it. Humanities is the most interesting because there's so many topics you can explore between social studies, architecture, building, art. It's all at writing, social studies, it's all in the humanities. I wish they taught foreign language to younger students because it's good for travel because you sound so dumb if you go to a place in Africa if you're speaking English. They know you're a Taurus and you don't want to stick out. And then don't forget the box at the bottom that says my favorite school subject is. What is the class that you would like to have all day? My interest for drawing started when I was nine years old. Um, even in like kindergarten and preschool, I could draw more than all the other kids. So college level arts courses. <laughs> but I'm the only 11 year old in that class. Everybody there, over 20. Wow, okay. I think we're all ready for page five. Ways to learn new information. So indicate how you feel about each option with a check mark. For example, if you like to learn by listening, check the thumbs up column. If you don't care either way, check the middle column. And if you don't feel comfortable learning in the way listed, check the thumbs down column. And we look at personality and the kids come up with a profile because they're never one thing. And, and it's interesting because we know that um, the kids that come out high on practical managers, they, and an extreme of that can be cognitive rigidity. These are kids who need a lot of directions. They need to know what's expected of them. They need clear directions. Where the kids who come out highest and learn an expert, they just crave knowledge. Like one of them told me, like a tiger stalks his prey. And these are the ones who love to argue. And they're the, the creative problem solvers who do everything their own way. They are really, a lot of our kids who were ADHD are creative problem solvers. And then there are the people persons who are great at understanding the emotional climate of the classroom. They're like your young psychologists. And so we put all these things together what we learn from the intelligence tests, what we know about their achievement, what their special talents are, so that we can plan an appropriate program. We then ask, what might get in the way? Well, Sydney doesn't like to write. She blurts out answers all the time and interrupts. She doesn't stop talking about what she likes, very argumentative and easily distracted when not interested. And at home, when she's busy working, it's almost impossible to get her attention. So we, we need to factor in that information as well. But folks, if I could only ask one question, this is the question I would ask. When are Sydney's times of personal best? When is it that you see that yellow shiny child where the blue is greatly diminished? Mom says when she's involved in art, especially animation. Dad finds it when they're really engaged in politics or talking about movies that they've seen together. The teacher says she likes to participate in discussions and working on an art project. What does Sydney say? When I'm creating images and animations or performing on stage. Folks, if we know this is when Sydney's at her best, wouldn't we want to do more of it? Wouldn't we try to incorporate these kinds of activities into, the, into her program, into the curriculum? And if we say no, then I think we're masochists. <laughs>
because we believe that gifted behaviors take place in certain people, not all people, at certain times, not at all times, and under certain circumstances, not all circumstances. This comes from the school-wide enrichment model by Renzulli and Reese. It is our job when working with a twice exceptional child to discover those times and circumstances that this child can perform at their optimal best. It doesn't tell you that in the IEP. And so we call it magic. When we start putting these pieces together, magic happens at the intersection of interest and ability. And what we try to do is come up with ways to integrate those strengths, interests, and talents in the curriculum, and we also come up with a talent plan. So let me show you what this looks like. This is a way to show Sydney when we put all the pieces together. So what do we know about her? We know that she's an avid reader, that she prefer prefers her historical novels, thinks metaphorically, passionate about art, loves to argue. So then I'm thinking, what could I do in the classroom to incorporate these things? Well, maybe we'll let, make sure we encourage her reading historical novels and graphic novels. Maybe we want to make sure that when we plan a unit, we have debates and moral dilemmas. How are we going to integrate art into her program? Synectics is a program that allow, that has kids thinking metaphorically. It's, it's about encouraging creativity and program. I want the teachers to know about that program and use it. How can we, she's also in drama. How can we use performing arts? Can we suggest comic books as products? Allow doodling. For her to process information, we found out she learns much better when she doodles when the teacher is talking. Then I want to move over to the talent plan. What happens in school that is right up her alley where we could see her grow from novice to expert? She ought to be on the debate club. She ought to be on the debating team. She needs to have advanced art classes. She needs, maybe she can earn some high school Carnegie credits by assisting the art teacher. Maybe she should be in the drama club. There's something called Shakespeare Boot Camp. Let's put this in her talent plan and let's ask her parents because we believe that parents should not be homework policemen. We believe that parents need to be opportunities maker, makers for their kids and help with the talent development agenda. So entering getting her involved with art in the in, you know near where she lived getting her involved in summer programs all were part of this talent plan through talent these kids develop executive function skills time management skills learn how to stay in the struggle because it's it's intrinsically motivating to them. It's their goal and they have to work harder and they do it when it's important and when it's relevant and when it's authentic. We also do something that we call a TDO. When Sydney was in eighth grade and wasn't writing, Sydney was having one meltdown after another in gym. She could, she, her motor skills were lagged behind those of her age mates. And it was a time, she just could not function. It was so stressful that she would just have one meltdown after another and would end up going to the psychologist's office during physical education. One day she said to the psychologist, you know, you have a blank wall there. I have an idea for a mural. I envision 
my classmates as different kinds of creatures with different kinds of personalities. I'm going to represent them on your board and you could use it for therapy. Well, you know, in the old way of thinking, one might say, Sydney, when you start doing your work and finishing your homework and behave in gym class, we'll let you do it. At Bridges Academy, we see that this is what she's asking for. What she needs right now is a TDO, a talent development opportunity. We were not, we needed to let her do something that was important to her, to make her want to come to school, to make her believe in herself. So we asked her if she could present a proposal to the head of school, and she says, will you help me write it? Because often we couldn't get her to write. But this was really important, and she wrote a wonderful persuasive argument to the head of school. And he said to her, instead of Jim for the next marking period, you could paint your mural. And it was after that that she began to write and actually be kinder, gentler to her classmates. We do, don't do this often, but, we all, but it comes up at least couple of times a year for different kids at Bridges. What, when all else fails, can we just take them out of the curriculum and put them in a talent development opportunity? For her senior project, this is how she represented her classmates, no longer as creatures. She did a caricature of each one. They develop such wonderful relationships. Their social, her social awareness just soared when she began to, and this class grew so close as a class. In her junior year, you know, she had, did a lot of art with her art teacher who was also an artist. She said to her art teacher, you know, I need to study eyes this year. I don't look people in the eyes in my part portfolio to get into Caltech is going to be lacking some uh, artwork where I draw eyes better. So instead of putting her in a social skills class to make eye contact, she thought it would be important to look people in the eye, not just to make eye contact, so that her art would improve. Wow. Wow. When we are working with these kids and we're trying to put them in a program and we want an educational fit, people might say, where are they going to get their good remedial services and accommodations? What I recommend is when looking for an educational fit, most people are concerned about services, accommodations, and learning support. Yet we know this to be true. The most important issue is whether or not the opportunities offer in that school, match a child's particular talents and interests. If a child is a musician, they better have a good music program in that school. If this child is a great inventor, they better have opportunities like the Invention Convention. You need to start in a school and where they value what that child's talent in, and then you begin to put the other pieces in place. And we know that uh, Ed Hollowell, who is a psychologist, who is an, a psychiatrist actually, who works with ADHD people, and he says, I have learned first and foremost to look for interests, talents, strengths, shades of strengths, or the mere suggestion of a talent. Knowing that a person builds a happy, successful life, not on remediated weaknesses, but on developed strengths, I have learned to place those strengths at the top of what matters. And I think I'm going to end there to give you time whoops, to ask some questions. And I do also want you to know two things, that we do have graduate programs where people can get trained in this through a certificate program, master's or doctorate. We have lots of parents in our program. But more importantly, get subscribe to the TUI News and Variations. It's free, the link is there. It gives you wonderful information about how to work with your TUI students. So, questions.
Okay, let's see. I don't see anything in the chat. Um, Elizabeth, uh, I'm gonna, well, let's see. If anyone has any questions, can you please put them in the chat? I am watching both the Facebook and the, um, uh, the Zoom chat room, so, or chat line. So if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and post them. Uh, we do ask that you uh, not make it personal, but just ask generic questions if you would. And we'll go ahead and speak them out loud so we, we can include everyone because we've got two different platforms we're on right now. Does anyone have a question for Dr. Baum? Elizabeth, maybe is there one that you might be able to help share that you heard from? Oh, here we've got a couple coming in. They're just taking a little bit. Uh, how do we advocate this type of approach <laughs> in a public school setting? And I am really out of public school before I came to Bridges. I was a teacher of the gifted. I was a first grade teacher. I was a, a special ed teacher. And I think the way to do it, first of all, because this isn't that hard, you need to have an advocate at the IEP meetings. You need to have someone, and sometimes it's the teacher of the gifted, who is a, acts as a wonderful advocate and begins, and if you could just add one talent goal to that IEP, or just say we need to also have a talent plan. And I think when you begin to offer choices, and it's teachers, teachers don't mind doing this if it's not, instead of offering an accommodation, it's easier for teachers just to offer kids choices. It makes them feel better and uh, the whole class runs better. One of the other questions I'll go ahead and um, ask, but it was somebody that came a little late and wanted to know about the depression issue and how often this occurs. Um, I'm not sure you spoke at much about that. It was, I think, just briefly commented on. Well, we did find that by high school, a lot of these kids are on antidepressants. It's really hard for them to be so smart and so sensitive and so aware and have challenges that are just difficult. And uh, more, too many of them. Sure. Elizabeth, do you have a question that you might be able to share? Uh, I know you listened earlier and you were with the other teachers where there may be something that the teachers shared earlier that you could add to this conversation. Oh, you're on mute. Did it not go off? There you go. Sorry about that. Um, there was a little bit of a discussion in the earlier one about how, how early do you see these signs of twice exceptionalities and um, how early can we begin that um, process of in an IEP meeting or um, advocating for your student focusing on the talent and the strength-based differentiation? Um, yeah, we talked about that a lot. And I think what happens is when kids are, are struggling in school, we get into that fix it model very early. And these kids are so bright and sensitive that they often feel like they're broken. And it's and you don't get fixed very quickly. So if, for instance, if you put talent development on hold, everything else is gonna slow down. So you might want to put kids in a reading program in the summer, but they also need something to do in the summer that's all about their talent. They need to feel smart. And so it's got to be a two pronged approach right from the get go. And I think that's that's wise to think about right now as we head into these summer programs. I know our district is offering a variety of enrichment, um, but really maybe giving this this time frame when we've we have learning loss, but may not be identified at this time, but the, to really allow our students to explore their strengths enjoy those areas that they're interested in. They will come back to school at the end of the year feeling smart, feeling like they've accomplished something. And um, I think it's, we, we talk about in some of the uh, some training, they talk about recreation, but they call it recreation. They recreate themselves. We do have another question and it, 
is addressing, uh, it comments on this uh, is a valid approach for students with cultural and SES challenges as well. The question is, do you advocate a profile approach for identification? Yes. Uh, we certainly want to look at, I mean, to me, we can look at certain test scores or look at partial test scores, never full scale. But we also should be collecting a portfolio of what this child can do. If we're talking about identifying the gift, we, we need to collect a portfolio. Sometimes we let them audition. Well, so we have some enriched science programs, and if they do really well in that science program, and they've kind of auditioned for more advanced classes later on. We've, we've had great success with that. And, and, and certain kinds of checklists. Uh, that are in areas of their strength. On the other hand, if you have a bright child and you and they've been identified as gifted, but they're struggling, you certainly want not to wait until they're failing. And if they are just achieving a level or even getting A's, you need to ask yourself, at what cost? Are they putting much more time in it than their peers? Are they needing help than their peers? So we need to be on the lookout for both the talent and a possible challenge. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. I, as I said, there were parents on Facebook Live watching you as well as in our, our group setting here. Um, we really appreciate the presentation. I'm a parent of a 2E child and understand a lot of this and, and Elizabeth will chuckle at that. Um, and we have gone through a long years uh, getting that child to where she is. And, you know, I think what's important is we all have to continue to, to explore different options to keep these kids happy. Um, Elizabeth referenced that this summer there are lots of program opportunities. I would just remind parents to go to the district website and look at the, uh, the different programs. There are gifted programs that are at one of our schools um, and there are just a, a myriad of classes being offered uh, in all grade levels, both online and through uh, live instruction. So we're very excited to have that opportunity back. Uh, and again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Parents, remember we have two more gifted presentations coming up. Um, and if you got the info on this, you'll get the others as well. I don't have it to cut, cut and paste. Um, Elizabeth, if you want to make a few last comments. Um, just absolutely thank you, Dr. Baum, for joining us today. It's been a full day and great education for teachers and parents, and we're just so grateful for that. Um, we do have a, a series coming up on April 22nd in two weeks with um, Dr. Jean Peterson and a focus on 712 um, for teachers and parents. So stay with us for that. And then on May 6, Dr. Wingers and Dr. Ruder, who will be talking about um, a lot of social and emotional needs for our gifted students. So again, thank you for joining us. We're so grateful. I love being with you and good luck and let's welcome back everyone to live experiences. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. All right. Have a good evening, folks. I'm going to go ahead and disconnect this. We've got a, a board meeting for those that would like to go. Thank you.